Um, so I'm going to just uh, do a very quick commercial about uh, SurePath. I'm going to give you some data on fundraising activity specific to SMB SaaS companies in North America in 2016, just so you know what's happening. And then uh, just give you some kind of practical tips and tricks for how you go about raising capital. Before we get started, um, who here has raised capital for their company already? Okay, about a third of the room. Everyone else is bootstrapped? Awesome. All right, cool. So a brief introduction to myself. Um, I've been in the venture-backed startup world since the late 1990s. I uh, spent 14 years as CFO for a number of venture-backed startups, most notably uh, FreshBooks and Shopify. Uh, in between those two, I went to the dark side for three years as a VC, investing primarily in SMB SaaS. So just spent a lot of time thinking about how you build a really large company when you sell to lots of really small customers. and so. This SMB world is, is kind of my sweet spot. Um, I launched SurePath Capital Partners almost two years ago. It'll be two years in May. Uh, we help companies like yours raise growth capital. And then we help you articulate and then realize profitable, intentional exit strategies. And we like to have ongoing relationships with our clients and really help you think through how and when to raise capital and how and when to get to know companies that could ultimately be a buyer for your business. Um, as I mentioned before, we have spent a ton of time in the SMB space, and we have a very clear aspiration for our, for our company, SurePath. We want to be the leading advisor in the SMB software space. Anyone who's thinking about raising capital for their SMB startup or selling their SMB startup, we want them to call us. And because I come from the space, both as an operator and as an investor, we've been able to develop very deep relationships with all the most active buyers in the SMB world. Here's just a few of the deals that uh, we've closed uh, in the last few months. And I think that's it for the commercial. All right, so SMB fundraising activity. So I don't know if you can see that here, but this is a look at kind of the deals kind of by round and kind of by quarter. Uh, in 2016. There were 234 rounds into companies that serve SMB in some capacity. That includes, you know, there's companies that only focus on SMB and then there's companies that serve SMB and mid-market and kind of large enterprise. If you look at kind of the breakdown, so the black bar is kind of just deal count and then the red bar is aggregate dollars per category. Um, so, you know, no surprise, you know, lots of uh, deal counts at the lower stages, so kind of seed Series A, but most of the dollars go to the later rounds, kind of Series C, Series D and up. So, you know, no, no earth shattering uh, news there. Um, but I've also included kind of median round size. So angel rounds were a median of 700K, whereas the Series A's were a median of 8.4 million. That's actually up pretty significantly. If you've been reading TechCrunch too much, you, you see that round sizes just keep going up and up. And what used to be a Series B is now a Series A. And uh, that trend is definitely reflected here. You know, Series A's used to be more in that three to five range, and now they're closer to the eight to 10 range. If you look at kind of deal volume by quarter, you know, no massive takeaways there uh, other than Q4 was you know, lower in terms of aggregate dollars than what I would have expected. I'm going to get into some of the bigger rounds, and so you'll see the timing of those outliers heavily influences, you know, total dollars that you see by quarter. But just to give you a sense for kind of what's going on. And, well, actually, I'll, I'll talk about this other aspect in a minute. So a lot of information here. Um, this is an extract from the state of SMB SAS report that we issued just about a month ago, which is why you see a lot of text. And I should mention, I'm, I'll post these slides. So you can take photos if you want, but I, I'll post them. Um, and so you can get that report, but it, I've got a couple of slides that come from that, where we just broke down basically the verticals that venture investors are investing into. And it's funny, if you've seen any of those Luma landscape maps, you know, marketing tech has been super fragmented with lots of companies for a long time, and yet it remains the most active area for new venture investments. 
Um, and then back office kind of business management solutions was the next biggest category. But really the punchline here when I look at this is like all aspects of kind of the front, middle, and back office for SMBs are being funded. You know, there's just lots of innovation, lots of companies that are being created to go after all aspects of a small business owner's needs. If I drill down, if I take the kind of the business management or back office solutions and the marketing tech solutions, so we just kind of break those down, you'll see just the categories that are kind of most popular. So analytics, productivity, collaboration are some of the, the, the themes that you see on the back office side. Again, analytics shows up for marketing tech as well. Content, you know, kind of inbound marketing is very much on the rise on the marketing tech side but pretty widely distributed. So just again, a large cross section of you know, types of applications are, are getting funded. And this is kind of in stark contrast to what you see on the consumer side or the enterprise side. Like you know, if you look at kind of consumer markets and enterprise markets, those tend to be winner takes all markets that have a shorter half-life. You know, inside some number of years, the market will be won. And there's just a huge difference between being the number one and the number three player in the market. You know, like no one would start a social network to compete with Facebook today. Like that market's just one. But when you look at SMB, what you see is just a large evergreen market that's sort of too large for any one vendor to dominate. Uh, you know, there's like 30 million small businesses in the US alone, 60 million in the English speaking world, and 600 million globally. And that's just too many customers for one vendor to go after. And so if, if we take even the accounting software world where I came from prior to founding SurePath, so again, 30 million small businesses in the US, only 5 million of them use QuickBooks, even though that product's been around for like over two decades. And you would just never see that in an enterprise. You know, that market would be one, they'd have 80% penetration. So bit of a tangent, but that's a, an important thing to bear in mind for, for you as you're thinking about your funding and your growth strategy. Chances are very good that you're going to be serving a large kind of evergreen market. And so the point of that for you as an operator is you can decide how fast you need to go. You know, you could bootstrap for a long time or forever if you wanted. Um, you know, in a talk I gave last year on SMB exits, I noted that well over half of the exits that happen in the SMB world are for bootstrap companies. And again, you, if you read TechCrunch all the time, you, don't, you think it's all venture funded because that's all you read about. But most exits, in fact, are, are not like that at all. Um, just another little tidbit, you know, industry kind of like niche vertical applications are on the rise. Uh, legal in particular with companies like Clio out of Vancouver um, have all you know, raised large funding rounds in the last year. And this is, just the, this is just the beauty of the internet, right? You know, back when I started out in the venture back startup world in the late 90s, it was really hard to reach customers. You had to build direct sales teams and you couldn't afford to build these kind of vertical specific applications. You had to go very horizontal, very broad. But now you can target and find you know, exactly who you need to reach. And so you're seeing these vertical applications take off. And, and investors like them because there is a path. If you take the legal industry as an example, that is a very defined thing. It's a specific target market to go after. And therefore, you can build a thesis as an investor around one vendor you know, being able to be the clear market leader in that market, as an example. So this is just a few of the names of, you know, as we looked at those 234 uh, funding rounds that happened for SMB startups last year, here are some of the, the most active investors. Um, so probably names that you all know. Um, the, the funny thing is, is, you know, when we look at most VC firm, you know, portfolio pages, You'll see lots of consumer startups, you'll see lots of enterprise startups, you'll see relatively few SMB focused startups. And that's reflected here in the numbers, right? You know, there's 234 deals that, that have happened, but the only fund that actually got into double digit is Techstars, which of course by their very nature, they're just cranking out all these seed stage companies. It's easy for them to get into double digits. But you know, in my experience, SMB is about you know, like 4% of any venture firm's portfolio. 
And, and that's just because it's really tough, right? You know, I'm going to talk about that in kind of the second half of this talk here. But it's tough to build a business uh, that is, you know, quote unquote venture scale when you're selling to lots of small customers who churn all the time and it's, it's expensive to reach them. And so a lot of VCs shy away in the early stages from backing companies that focus on SMB for that very reason. But nevertheless, these are the names. So if you're raising money, find ways to talk to these guys. Just for uh, useless trivia and conversation uh, around cocktails later, these are the biggest rounds that happened in SMB SaaS uh, last year. Again, as I mentioned earlier, some of these companies, such as like StackPath and Asana, are not pure play focused on SMB. They serve mid-market and enterprise customers as well. Whereas Gusto is absolutely, you know, 100% focused on on small business. But some really some really big rounds here, and um, you know, Gusto doesn't have the highest round last year, but it, it has raised, you know, cumulatively a ton of capital, and is probably again number two on the list here. Question. Yeah. So you mentioned that for uh, early stage uh, startups that are focusing on SMEs, VCs are not yeah, so question, if you didn't hear it, is, you know, if the VCs don't like investing in early stage SMB SaaS because the metrics aren't there, you know, what's the suggestion? And to be clear, there are rounds that happen into early stage SMB. Um, I'm going to talk about this in the second half. You know, the, 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 the basically the thing is um, you basically need to prove them wrong. So you need to have traction that shows that you clearly understand how to get to customers and that you're keeping the customers. You've found like a profitable way to acquire customers. Even if the absolute number of customers is still quite small, if it's clear that you are growing on month over month, you know, if you're growing like a 5% last month and, you know, 10% you know, monthly growth three months from now, then it's just clear that it's working. You basically have, like, they won't take a leap of faith is sort of the punchline, but I'll give you some more specific metrics to shoot for in, in a few moments. Cool. Ah, perfect, good segue. All right, how to raise your round. So first, let's kind of talk about the VC alphabet, right? You see these rounds all the time, and it's A, B, C, D, E, et cetera. So like, what do those things mean? And, and again, those have changed, right? The bar has changed where, you know, the, the, the Series A rounds that are happening today look like Series Bs two years ago, et cetera. But as a snapshot today, these are kind of the rounds that I see at the different stages. So seed stage tends to be, you know, anything from initial idea up to kind of early revenues um, tends to be rounds of three million or less. You do not necessarily need to have revenue in order to raise that seed round. Who do you get it from? You get it from angels and seed VCs. And the whole purpose of it is to establish and validate product market fit. Uh, Series A is, you know, bigger, you know, three to $10 million rounds. We saw the median round a few slides ago was 8.4 million last year for Series A. Um, generally speaking with SaaS businesses, you need to have, you know, 1 million annualized recurring revenue and up to be Series A ready. Uh, you're going to raise, you know, growth rates. You know, if you look at kind of at the early stage, so at least doubling your business every year, so at least 2x. Um, but, you know, best in class investors will be growing, or, or businesses will be growing kind of 3x and 5x per year. So that's kind of the bar, certainly at the early stage. And, you know, there's you know, just one sole purpose for, um, for raising the A, which is to find that you know, clear channel of growth, or what I call the sausage machine. If you just found a way to make 10 sausages today, I'm going to give you a bunch of capital so you can make 50 sausages. You had a question? Yes, um, at the seed level and at the A level, what percentages are the entrepreneurs giving up in order to get those monies? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, a good question. I've everyone heard, you know, what percentage of a company is a founder giving up at each, each round stage? You know, I think it ranges, you know, 10 to 20% is probably <coughs> the typical range, you know, 10 on the low end. I think, you know, by the time, you know, seed stage, you know, you tend to see those, the hat gets passed around to a lot of folks to raise those round, could be a lots of small checks. In aggregate, maybe 20% dilution. Um, 
But if an investor steps up and leads and has a thesis for your business and wants to lead the Series A, they probably want 15 to 20% ownership, right? Just to make the math work for their fund. And I, I should have thrown in a slide to kind of switch gears and, and talk about basically the scale of returns that you need in order to actually be meaningful for a fund. But I think the punchline is, you know, if you don't have you know, a minimum level of ownership, it's just not worthwhile, right? Because most of your investments don't work out at the early stage. And so the ones that do need to make up for all the ones that don't. And do these companies typically build out a, a fundraising plan that says that at seed round we're gonna give up 10 and at series A we're gonna give up 20? Do they go into it that strategically or does each round just present a new range of variables? Yeah, I, I, I think, here's the thing, there's no market value for your privately held startup, right? The market value is what an investor is willing to pay. And so you can have intentions. And, uh, you know, it's funny, the, the venture business is, it's all about outliers, right? And so if you have that shit hot company that is just growing like stink and investors are flooding into you, you can absolutely dictate terms. It's like, this is what I'm gonna raise, you know, this is what I'm looking for, here's the pre, here are the terms. Are you in or are you not? But for most merely mortal startups, that's not the reality. And so you'll end up just, you know, there's a back and forth and you'll find that right partner. I th there are definitely rules of thumb, right? Which is that, you know, 15 to 20 points of dilution per round. That, by the way, does not include dilution to create a stock option plan, right? So if you don't have, that's just, that's just for issuing the shares to, for the new investors, right? But then you're typically providing another 10 to 20 points for a, a stock option plan, and that's gonna get topped up every round. So the all-in dilution can, can actually add up. Now, obviously, the bet is, you know, for you as an entrepreneur, is that you are trading that dilution, you know, to go for an outcome that would be impossible to achieve without that capital. Any other questions? And then, you know, the last, I've kind of put B plus, because once you're kind of into series B and beyond, it's really, it's just a sausage machine, right? You know, you can make 10 sausages today. I'm going to give you some money so that you can make 50 sausages and 100 sausages. So it's all about um, just exploiting that kind of very repeatable channel for finding and keeping customers. And then the, the other big theme, you know, when you get, like by the time you raise a series B, you know, your early exit opportunities kind of go away, so you're committing to build a market-leading company. And so another big theme that you see at the Series B stage is building out your executive team, which is maybe something you don't think a ton about before. All right, the three Ps. Um, so this is just a, a handy little acronym that I've come up with for kind of what you need at each stage of the fundraising. You know, there's, there's people, product, or progress, AKA traction. And the way I look at it, at the seed stage, you only need one of those things because the investors are gonna take a leap of faith. There's so much that's unknown. It's gonna get figured out over time. By the time you get to series A, you need two of those three, but you know, series B and beyond, you need all three. And, and at all times, if you're only ever gonna have one, have traction. You know, you could have this totally unknown team that's never done anything before, um, a product that is maybe incomplete, but if it's just you know, blowing out the doors and you're growing 20% per month, you're gonna raise money. There's no question, right? And so traction just kind of forgives all sins. And so easier said than done, but that's the way I look at kind of what you need at each stage. Yep? So uh, when you look for traction, uh, uh, you focus more on the revenue or would you rather have uh, profitability you know, set aside and focus more on growth? Uh, so, like, traction, like, so there's a way, few ways to look at traction. You know, revenue is one of them. I do not think that profitability is important, other than, you know, for you as a founder, right, if you're running out of cash and you need to raise money by a certain date or you're dead, that's pretty important to you, right? But as an investor, what I care more about is your unit economics. You know, if you spend a buck to acquire a customer and that customer's worth four bucks, I want you to go and acquire a crap ton of those customers and therefore I don't actually want you to be profitable. Uh, but at the early stages, you know, re revenue doesn't have, like revenue's great, 
um, and is, is really important. But at the really early stages, there are early indicators of traction that could even precede revenue. You know, if it's kind of a free application, you know, looking at engagements, you know, like daily active users over monthly active users to just see the quality of the engagement, kind of session lengths, virality rates. There's other indicators that kind of precede revenue that could give an investor a sense for the fact that users love your product. Does that make sense? All right, cool. This is an eye chart. You won't be able to see, read all of this, but again, I'm going to post it up. But this is just, if we look at the rounds that, that we run at SurePath, this is what a typical process looks like from start to finish. And, you know, really three to four months, uh, six months at a stretch, but that's usually what we budget to get a round done. Um, I think earlier, you know, seed stage rounds can happen faster because you're basically asking people to take a leap of faith on you as a, as a founder. But later on, there's just more meat on the bone, there's more diligence to be done, and just takes more time. So, you know, a few phases, Here's the, there's the big kind of prep phase, and, you know, just getting ready, building your decks, building your models, being clear on who you want to approach, building a pipeline of investors. Um, there's a road show. You know, something I see founders do a lot, and I think I'm going to talk about this in a few moments, is, um, you know, they get introduced to an investor, they start talking, they have one meeting, they have another meeting, they think it's going really well, and then the investor says, eh, you know what, when you look like this, come back, I'd be interested. And then they go and do that with, like, someone else and then someone else and before you know it like three months have passed and you've just wasted a whole bunch of time wasted a whole bunch of runway and also your story feels really old to investors and, and the point of that is having these kind of one-off conversations versus talking to everyone at the same time you know just doesn't work um, so when you kick off a roadshow really important to be talking to everyone Here are just some of the KPIs that I look for specifically for SMB SaaS companies as kind of a baseline. So uh, in terms of churn, so this is one of the biggest criticisms that investors have about SMB SaaS companies is, uh, you know, the customers are really small, then they, they churn out. If your churn is 3% per, per month or more on a logo basis, I think it's going to be pretty tough to raise the round. Um, you know, I think is, you know, like that implies a tenure of, you know, like three plus years. It's pretty small. Those customers tend to not be worth very much. On a revenue basis, so there's the logos is like if I had 100 customers this month and three of them left, I have 3% churn. But the ones that remain, those 97 that remain, might actually grow. And so the revenue that I get from those customers um, that's what's that's kind of the revenue retention so that's what this is and you know on a revenue retention basis I'm looking for you know no more than 1% revenue loss per month in the ideal world you know you have negative revenue churn which means that even though those three customers leave as an example the ones that remain more than make up for the lost revenue that you actually grow and that's why you see you know companies like box that burnt a hole in the ground you know, leading up to a very successful IPO because the customers that remained grew more than 30% every year. It was like way more than their churn. And so basically every cohort of customers was a growing annuity. And obviously investors love that. So that's kind of what I look for on, on churn. If you look at lifetime value over cost to acquire customer, and let's, let's define both of those things. Like lifetime value is how much you charge your customer per month times the number of months that they stay times your gross margin. So that's like a gross contribution margin from your customers. And then divide that by how much you paid to acquire them on a fully loaded basis. So how much you paid in terms of like marketing dollars and like sales and marketing bodies. If you divide those two and your number is less than 3x, I think you'll struggle to raise. You probably can raise, but you have a good, not great business. Whereas kind of 4x and up is, is really good. On the flip side, if you have like 10x or something, you're probably being nowhere near aggressive enough. You know, you're just, you should be investing way more in your CAC to drive more growth. 
Uh, payback period in SMB, uh, I really like to keep it less than 12 months. I say that really because SMB tenure, so the number of months the customer sticks around, tends to be, you know, 36 to 48 months. Um, so if you're, if it's more than 12 months to get paid back, then you're, you're starting to throw off that LTV to CAC ratio. And then, yeah, sorry, go ahead. For the cost of that position, payback? That's right, yeah. Um, you know, if it costs you 120 bucks to acquire a customer and you, you earn 10 bucks a month from them, you know, that's the baseline. And then growth rate, you know, again, if you want to raise that venture round, you want to be an early stage venture round, you want to be at least doubling per year, ideally more. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. Clarifying growth, you're not just talking about revenue, it depends on whatever metrics you're trying to use. That would be a revenue growth. Yeah, I mean, you could look at, you know, user bases, uh, and again, for those early rounds, you know, if your user base, you know, if you're growing 10% per month or something, that's an early indicator. But yeah, on the revenue side, you know, at least doubling. And, you know, best in class, like Thomas Tungus gave a talk here last year, and, um, you know, he really talked about, like, 3x is sort of a baseline for him, but he really is looking for the companies that are growing 5x per year, which is few and far between. And, you know, the last thing I'll say in terms of the KPI, so again, one of the criticisms from investors about SMB, uh, so I'm repeating myself, really small customers, hard to acquire, they don't stick around, it's really expensive. And there's only so far that direct performance channels can go for you before your marginal cost of acquisition just starts to go up and up, and, and therefore compressing your LTV to CAC. And so what you really need to be thinking about um, maybe not at the very early stage, but certainly after that, is starting to think about channels. Uh, because ultimately, again, if we go back to 30 million small customers, um, you can't reach them all directly, right? You could just not possibly reach, raise enough capital to reach them. Uh, and even if you could, your cost to acquire those customers would just keep rising. You'd be a victim of your own success. And so having channels is, is super important. Um, and I, I know that's a focus of this conference and having folks talk to each other, but uh, I can't overemphasize that. Best practices. Uh, we've covered probably some of this already, and you've probably heard all of this kind of VC 101 platitudes in the past, but nevertheless, we'll spend some time on them. First thing is, you know, know what investors are looking for. And that's not a general statement, that's a very specific statement to each stage. If you're a seed stage company, you need to know what you need to look like to raise a seed round. Same for the A, same for the B, et cetera, et cetera. And also know, you know, if you are targeting, I see this all the time, where let's say you have, I don't know, a marketing tech uh, startup. And you get introduced to a partner at a fund just because your friend knows them. Well, that partner may not actually look at marketing tech. And so you're kind of wasting your time. And, and that's especially true at the later stage rounds. You know, like the early stage investors tend to be a little bit more broad based. But, you know, the growth stage investors are t tend to have, you know, certain categories or verticals that they spend all their time in. And they'll talk to every company in those verticals. And so if you're not in their vertical, you're kind of wasting your time. And so doing the research up front and knowing exactly who you should be talking to at a given firm uh, because they spend time at your stage and in your vertical is, is super key. And then, you know, once you know who those people are, don't just guess their email and email them. You know, get a warm introduction. Um, best source of introductions are from existing portfolio CEOs, especially if that CEO's already made them money. Uh, other co-investors, one really bad source of an intro, like let's say someone passes on your business and you say, hey, could you introduce me to so-and-so? Like that's like the worst possible intro ever. Like an investor who's making an intro who's not investing in the round, it's, it's just really bad. Anyway, um, control timing. I talked about this a little bit. You know, you want to be talking to all investors at the same time. So parallel processing, not, you know, these one-off conversations. Um, I think that's particularly true down here in the valley. I don't know where everyone's based. Uh, I find that 
I don't know, there's just sort of like a short half-life, like stories can feel really old down here versus in other, other parts of the country where there's, they can go on longer. Look for forcing functions. So as you're thinking about, now, a forcing function for you could be, well, I have six months of cash left, so I need to raise money in six months. So that, that's great, but that's your problem. If you now look within those six months, like what is happening in terms of, you know, new product releases, big announcements, big partnerships, are there events that are happening in the next six months that could drive an investor to like actually move and commit? And so think about those forcing functions and build them into your timing so that you can use those positive events to generate momentum and get, get the investors to commit. Um, you know, next one point is on lawyers. And um, I'm sure everyone's got horror stories about lawyers. I'm going through an acquisition right now, and uh, there's literally a one-to-one -one correlation between the headcount of our client that is selling and, like, deal professionals and, you know, company reps on the buy side. It's ridiculous. But the bottom line is kind of startup life boils down to a few big moments, all of which involve competent legal counsel. And if your cousin Joe has, like, you know, a general law practice and you're using him, it's not going to work, you know. Stick with the ones like Gunderson, Cooley, they just, they've got it figured out. Just stick with the name brands and, uh, you know, you'll be good. Last uh, best, yeah. About accounting <laughs> Yeah. You need legal help, but what about accounting help? Yeah, for sure. No, it's important as well. I, you know, if I, again, if I look at, so whether you're wanting to raise money or you're wanting to exit, there's a whole process kind of leading up to some interest and then you're going to have a deep anal probe, pardon the visual. <laughs> and, you know, you're, you, and the point is you need to have like a really solid back office, you need to have really great numbers, and you need to be due diligence ready. And so there's, I would kind of break down the accounting back office needs really into two buckets. One is kind of just your day-to-day -day running of the books. And, you know, for you as a founder, you know, you shouldn't be spending a ton of time on that personally. Like, that's okay to outsource. I, personally really recommend Cruise Consulting here in town for that. They are running books for maybe about 150 startups and it's just smooth, they know exactly what they're doing. So that's just a solved problem, just use that. Um, when it comes to then kind of audit, tax, um, you know, founder tax planning and just those big events, you probably want to be with the big four accounting firms versus a, a regional firm. Um, PricewaterhouseCoopers stands out to me as one that's made a commitment to the tech vertical, but others have as well. KPMG, I know, is trying to catch up to them. I think with all of those professionals, whether it's the Gundersons and Cooleys on the law side or PwC on the accounting side, you know, they should be looking at you not as a source of near-term fees, but as a valuable relationship, right? And therefore, they should be heavily, heavily discounting and having fixed fees at the early stage so that they can be there and, you know, rob you blind come the big exit. So that's the way I think. Does that answer your question? Um, other considerations. Are we doing a time? Okay, good. Um, I want to just contrast early stage fundraising, which is probably what everyone's most familiar with and what you read about on TechCrunch, uh, and contrast that with growth stage fundraising. So early stage it's all about the hustle. You know, you as founders have to get out there, you gotta get introduced to investors, you gotta just work it and try and get to a close. And it's all you making the effort. Whereas when you get to, let's call it seven million ARR and up, suddenly every, like all these firms that you've never heard of are emailing you and introducing themselves and they all, all have these Ivy League analysts who like are introducing you to their firm and the tables change. And, and that's because, well, first of all, not all that many startups get to that scale. And if you have that repeatable sausage machine that I talked about earlier, then that's just an amazing thing for a growth stage investor. Um, because you basically can generate venture scale returns without taking venture scale risk. The thing just works. And that's why everyone's doing these outbounds, trying to find those diamonds in the rough. And to be clear, for every 100 companies they contact, probably two of them are interesting, but they nevertheless want to talk to everyone. 
And then the other dynamic at the growth stage is again, you know, if I am a growth stage investor and I'm writing, I don't know, $15 million check, stakes are really high. Like I need, that thing needs to work. And so I'll probably talk to every single person in the industry uh, before making that investment. And so I guess the point there is if you're starting to get that now, if your inbox is starting to fill up, it doesn't mean they're actually interested in you, right? Those are not qualified conversations yet. Yeah? That's a great question because uh, I feel like a lot of times you get the associates that try to contact you. Yep. And so how do you politely say, hey, I don't want to talk to the guy who's been out of Harvard for four years. I'd rather talk to like a partner of so. Yeah, a great question. I, I, think, um, I think you should spend time with the associates. Um, that associate could be a partner at some point or it could be out in the industry. It's a really small world. No deal is going to get done at the associate level. Uh, and I do think there's a much higher probability of, you know, getting a deal to close if it originates at the partner level. But the associates and the analysts are there to bubble things up. And so I would say after that initial conversation, if they want to get more serious, you could politely ask them who would be the lead partner on this if these discussions go all the way. Or even better, you've done your homework and you've looked at their partner roster and you're like, yeah, Joe Blow looks like they have the exact relevant experience. They've invested in an XYZ company that's in our space. Can you bring them into the next call? Um, raising too much capital. Um, Sunir's given me the time check, so I'm going to blast through this. But, um, you know, I think too often we see these companies raising these big rounds and we celebrate that as success. But in reality, success is the exit at the end of the day, right? And there's too many exits that get celebrated where the founders make nothing uh, because the VCs all have these massive preference stacks and they take all the money. And, and so I think just the point here is, you know, it is possible to raise too much money and it's it feels like it's a free for all. There's all this money there. It's easy to go, well, easy to raise money these days. But just remember that it's um, it's a powerful instrument, right? And you know, to your question around dilution earlier, right? It's very dilutive every stage. I'm not against raising capital. Obviously, it's half of what we do. Um, but just go into it with your eyes kind of wide open. Um, raising from strategic investors versus raising raising from VCs. This is something that comes up a lot. Uh, I think what I would say there is do it only when you're at a certain stage, like call it at least five million in revenue and up, because I think before that, you don't know what you're going to be when you're growing up. You know, your company's still really young. You want to remain neutral, whereas when you're further along, I think that's when you can think about making some, you know, informed bets uh, and, you know, creating some deeper alliances. Using advisors, okay, I'm biased because I am one. I think you should, but not at the early stage. Use them only kind of at the growth stage and absolutely use them for exits. You do not want to be negotiating your exit with your future boss when you've never done this before. Explain exactly what you mean by advisors. Uh, I don't like to use the term investment bankers because they have a well-deserved, horrible reputation. <laughs> but, you know, folks who uh, can help you rate, you know, intermediaries who are deeply connected to investors and buyers and, and can help make those deals happen for you. Is that usually a percentage or? It's usually a percentage, yeah. Yep. Any other questions? If not, I think we're done. Right on time. Oh, sorry, yes. Question. Right. Uh, say you're in a scenario where you can raise seed funding, yep. so you're in your seed round, or maybe you've even completed your Series A and you're looking at the numbers and you have the option to become profitable or go pursue another round of funding. Yep. What are some reasons, reasons you can be, uh, what are some reasons that you would raise funding? What are some reasons that you would go the other way and just become profitable and not take on any more funding? That's a great question. And we, to be honest, we could spend a lot of time on that question. I hope everyone heard, but like you raise some money and you have a choice between either being profitable or kind of raising more money and like basically discuss. That's the question. And so the way I think about that is like, like there's a few different aspects. Um, if you have a recurring revenue business, then your unit economics are more, and the profitability of them is more important than your bottom line profitability as an investor. But investors do not covet, like the companies that investors covet the most are the ones that don't need them. 
And so if you're profitable, they're like, oh my God, I really need to invest in you. So there's this balancing act, you know, and I think if profit comes at the expense of growth, like if you were growing like this, but then in order to become profitable, you kind of start to flatten, that's a bit problematic, right? Because it's harder to bend the line back up again. So that's a thing. I think another thing to think about is just your aspiration. Like what does success mean for you? What are you trying to achieve? How big do you think this company can be? Um, you know, most exits are, you know, pretty small. And, uh, and if you raise too much capital, then that exit could be unprofitable for you. So there is a thing to think through there. If you really think, you know what, this thing is just, it's not going to be the next Zendesk. It's its, its own thing. It's fine. It's going to have an early exit. Then maybe raising less capital would make that exit more profitable for you. So it's, it's lots of nuances, to be honest. It's, not doing your question justice, but a few a things. Point. If profit comes at the expense of, of growth, that's, you know, you have to consider what your personal objectives are. So right. That's very helpful. Thank you. Cool. We're good. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, um, last question. One quick question. Uh, in seeking an advisor, someone's considering exit, do you have any advice or opinion on whether or not those uh, advisors should be licensed? Oh, great question. Yeah, I think uh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you should be an exempt market dealer in Canada or a FINRA, FINRA registered in the US. Um, there is this kind of gray area where you can be a consultant, uh, but if you are basically offering securities on behalf of someone, you should be licensed.